Mom and Dad, you are driving me nuts. Who's heard this before? <laughs> Who's said that before? <laughs> so, we know the best predictor of healthy childhood is the child's relationship to their parents. So there are six stages of parenting, and I'm going to go through them quickly. The first stage is image making. So before having children, the parents imagine the idea of ch having children and what it'll be like. For example, the way I imagined it was I would be the cool parent. I wouldn't be the punisher, but that turned out to be the wrong, <laughs> the wrong thing. So the second one is nurturing, and that's from birth to two years old. And that's when the parents start matching what they've imagined and how parenting is starting to look like. The third one is authority, and that's from age two years old to five years old for the child. And the parents start deciding what kind of parent they're going to be. Oh, sorry. Okay. So what are the rules that they're going to set and how they're, they're going to enforce it? And it typically starts at two, because that's where the child starts showing more of her or his personality. The fourth one is interpretive, and that's elementary school years, pre-adolescent years. And that prompts the parents to see the images that they've had of parenthood and how realistic that they've been so far. So they evaluate the past, and they also focus on how they're doing. The fifth one is interdependent, and that's teen years. So this one, the children are going through changes, physical changes, emotional changes, and the parents are taken up by surprise sometimes for how the child is becoming. So, you know, they may start dressing differently, wearing their hair in a different style, you know, trying to, you know, speak in a certain way or the language that they use. And the last one is, you know, beyond teen years. And that's departure. So parents start evaluating how they've parented their children for all these years. And they start to loosen their control. Because they know the children are now are moving on. And they're becoming their own adults. Let's see. OK. So do you nag your kids about homework, chores, and prayers? These actually arguing, arguing about chores is the most common issues that parents get into with their children. And nagging is not necessarily a negative term. It's really, it prompts as a reminder or an alarm for a child to do, to get something done and to fulfill a responsibility. And of course, we don't like chores as adults. How do we expect kids to like them? So. One way, of course, is to motivate them by providing reward system. And I'll talk more about that. So if your child's not doing their chores at all and you're really struggling, you can stop everything. Stop telling them what to do and just sit down and talk to them and figure out why they're not doing certain chores. What's really getting in the way? And that could be a really good opportunity for the child to start venting about maybe something else that's going on in their life. And timing a chore is really beneficial, setting a time, so telling them you have 20 minutes to wash dishes, this is how long it should take you. And, you know, that sets as a reminder. They know that, you know, by 30 minutes they've taken too long. And using structure, so hanging like a weekly calendar with, um, you know, who's responsible for what and having them check off every time they've completed a task or a chore. And it's advised not to turn chores into punishment, so because they're not going to enjoy it and they're not going to try to do it. So try to eventually they'll enjoy it a little bit. So the only time it's beneficial to to use a chore as a punishment is when the child has done something has wronged their sibling. So they end up doing the chores for their sibling for hurting them or yeah. hitting them, for example. And reward systems are very positive. Um, they, you know, rewarding them, basically, if you do all your chores this entire week, you can stay out late Saturday night with your friends an hour later, or you can go to bed an hour later, or you can spend time online for another hour. So rewarding them for the chores they've completed throughout the week. This is um, basically an example of a reward chart. There's so many templates online, 
and or you can create your own as a family project. And ways to encourage your child to pray. So we know change is not overnight. It's going to take time. You can't go from the child never praying to suddenly praying five times a day every day. So you take it, you, it's a gradual process, and of course we're recommended to start at seven years of age, but it's, if the kid is older, it's never too late to start. Um, so the best, some, some things that are helpful is to create an atmosphere at home that, to encourage prayer. So have them design a prayer room or a prayer hall, like a little masjid, and have them, you know, each child maybe gets their own prayer rug or, you know, their own scarf. So they know that this is, this is a personal thing that they can do and get excited about doing. And of course, praying as a family, at least when everybody's home after dinner. So making time that's taken out of everybody's schedule to do, to complete the prayers and being consistent. So with everything, we have to be consistent. It's like going to the gym, you know? We have to go all the time in order to see any kind of progress. And lastly, and the, probably the most important thing is to make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can instill the love for Salah for us in our hearts and also in our children's hearts. Oh, this little picture is just um, kids designing like um, a prayer clock. So each prayer they change the clock so they know when, what time the next Salah is. And limiting children from the use of technology and social media. So we are in the digital age, so we can't really stop our children from using the internet. So we all have smartphones. I mean, who doesn't have a smartphone in this room? <laughs> Who's, who doesn't have Wi-Fi or internet right now? So we got to work with our kids. Um, and it doesn't have to be overwhelming. So iPhone separation anxiety is actually a real phenomenon. So people are addicted to technology. And it's associated with feelings of unpleasantness, increasing of heart rate and blood pressure, and decreasing of cognition, and also a lower concentration. So here are some helpful tips. Um, monitoring the text messages. I know smartphones have parental control, so you can monitor. It, you can, I think there's a technology where you can mirror your iPhone to your kid's iPhone. I don't know, though, I'm not a technical person. <laughs> um, but there are apps and ways to find out what your children are looking at, what they're watching, limiting the time that they you know, use the internet. Maybe they can only use it for homework and maybe have 30 minutes to, to use their social media accounts. And also connecting with them, so adding them on social media, you know, learning how social, like Instagram, learn how it's used. Learn what a Snap story is or what Snapchat is. Update your app. <laughs> Be friends with them on social media. So you'll know if they blocked you or not. <laughs> Wanting to control who they befriend. So we know we lose control as they get older. We lose control of who they become friends with or who they talk to. So it's important when you feel like you're losing control of who they become friends with is to give them space. Give them some space to make decisions for themselves, to recognize you know, if they're in a good situation or a bad situation, and allow them the space so they can come and talk to you. And maintaining an open and honest relationship is also something that's gradual. And it can help the child spot toxic relationships. So, you know, we all know teens and ad well, adolescents in general, their brain is not fully developed. Um, and it, part of the frontal cortex, which is where they make judgment, you know, sound judgment and decisions and risk-taking behavior, that develops later. So how do we expect them to actually make good decisions when their brain isn't even fully developed? So understand where they're coming from and how their biology works. And always model good, good behavior. Even though you, don't, you may not notice it, your children are observing everything. They're observing when you go out to a restaurant how you're talking to waiters. You know, they know, they know, they're watching you closely, even if you don't recognize it. So modeling good behavior and seeing that you're in positive relationships will help them gear towards being in positive relationships. Enforcing appropriate curfews. So a curfew is not just an agreement of what time they're going to be home. It's knowing where they're at, who they're with, and what activities they're engaging in. So setting a clear uh, curfew is, more important, is very important. So not telling them, come home whenever the, when the movie's over. 
you know, they can watch three movies <laughs> and take advantage of that. So, you know, get home by 10, whether the movie's over or not. Or make sure you buy an early ticket so you finish before 10 so you get home on time. And also a curfew for a 14-year-old is gonna be different than a curfew for a 17-year-old. They're, you know, they're interested in different things. And uh, if they abuse the privilege, cut back on their curfew. So now they have to come home at seven, so they can't go out after seven, since they've abused, you know, the allowed time. And keep in contact, so, you know, you give them the freedom, but you also tell them to text you when they're arriving at their destination, and text you when they're finished and on their way home, so you know where they're at. I know that there are tracking apps, but people can also block locations or add locations, so just have them talk to you. Kids are smart, they know how to use this stuff too. And spell out the consequences so that if they have abused the privilege for a curfew, tell them why, why, why they're getting these consequences. Why are they now coming home earlier? They have to take responsibilities for, for their actions. How to pick your battles. So by setting rules, you're paying attention to their well-being. And so to determine what warrants your attention and justifies a battle, just ask yourself these questions and you're, you'll figure out which battle you have to choose. So will these rules keep my child from getting hurt? That you're, you're giving the, you know, the rules to your kid. Are they keeping them from getting hurt? Are they limiting, are, they, are these limits teaching my child right from wrong? Will these rules make my child easier to get along with? Will these boundaries give my child a sense of responsibility? So knowing why you're setting these rules and wh why you're getting into the, the argument in the first place. So figure out if the expectations and rules are, are they about pleasing you or actually teaching and guiding your child something. Maintaining control and listening. It's never too late, again, to gain control of your children's behavior. So you are the parent. Allow yourself to be the parent. Allow yourself to be the leader and the person in charge because that is your job, you know? Um, I know that sometimes parents will feel bad because, oh, they're being the bad guy. It's okay. You'll be a bad guy for a limited period of time and your kids will appreciate it later. So, and if you're gonna introduce a new behavior or something that they're gonna start doing, you know, make sure you explain that before you enforce what they have to do. And be consistent, again, be consistent with everything. And remember that you can do this and be easy on yourself and find support. Find people that you can vent to if you're having issues. Just, just to hear yourself out loud is helpful. Increasing your child's confidence and self-esteem. And that's something a lot of children and adolescents go through. Um, growing up, so how do you encourage that at home? The first thing is to praise them, so encourage them every time they've done something good, even if it's a small, small, tiny thing. Tell them you've done a really good job today, like washing these dishes, they were really clean, as an example. And set the realistic goals that help, you know, match the, the children's ambition and abilities. And be honest, if you failed in the past, share your failures with your kids, they learn a lot from you by you being honest and straightforward. And avoid any sarcastic remarks. So if a child loses a game or fails a test, find out how they feel about the situation. Not, you know, oh, you, I knew you would fail, or I knew you'd do this wrong, or I told you, I told you so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Encourage children, not only to do their best, but also to enjoy the process, and that being hurt or being sad or failing is part of the process. It's going to happen. So what kind of parent are you? There are four types of parent, parenting, parenting styles. First one is authoritarian. Basically, it's my way or the highway. I don't care what the kid thinks. I don't care what they feel. It's everything I say that goes in the house. Authoritative is different from authoritarian. So that parent creates a positive relationship, listens to the child's feelings and concerns and allows the child to have the space. Permissive, that's the parent was, that says, you know, kids will be kids, they're like, this is expected. You know, they can, like, I don't know how to enforce these rules. They're not gonna listen to me anyway. So the parent that doesn't really try. The last one is uninvolved. So people that have, you know, parents that have very little guidance, they don't really tell their kids what to do or where to go. 
you know, they're just kind of distant and not part of the child's life at all. Rules and boundaries. Um, so the first thing about teaching kids rules and boundaries, you can create an actual document that you share with your kids. They can save it to their desktops or you can print it out and hang it on you know, the living room that states all the things that everyone has to abide by at home and outside of the home. And remember to also include yourself in these rules because they will also apply to you. And they will, again, you're modeling the behavior by allowing them to watch you. Okay, almost done, oops. All right, reward good behaviors. I mentioned that earlier. When might professional help be necessary? So children will need therapy when they have problems that they can't cope with and you're unable to provide a solution for them. So, you know, um, these issues may affect how they feel, act, and do. And sometimes entire families can go to seek counseling because it could be a situation of communication barriers and or creating boundaries. And encourage in the family home, encourage expression of emotions. Have them talk about their feelings. Because if, it, if, if it's bottled up, they can go talk to somebody else that may not be the right person for them to talk to. And if you feel that there's a problem you can't solve, additional help will be necessary. So the last thing is, I encourage, if you feel like you know, you're, you're losing control, you're unable to help your kid, it's fine to ask for help. There, it's okay to not be okay. Okay, I'll read this really quick. <laughs> there are times when, yeah, it's not a good idea to wait. You can't just wait out a problem and, and hope that it gets better with time. Some things get worse with time. So, and sometimes, you know, to know if you need help immediately is if your child tells you or you notice that they're trying to hurt themselves or they're talking about hurting themselves. Um, that's usually a crisis if, if they're in that situation or if there's family history of mental illness and you become aware that the child might develop some of these symptoms. And if they're unusually anxious or really sad all the time, suddenly like who they are is changing you know, maybe something is wrong. They're irritable for a long period of time. Maybe it's time to, to ask for help. These are just services that are available in our area. I provide counseling for children, families, and I'm licensed in the state of Maryland. But feel free to contact me if you have any questions or concerns, or if you want me to share this PowerPoint slide with you. Thank you so much for your time. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>